All right, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with people that burn easily. Don't start, don't, don't start oh, hello. Um, you can turn that off, George. This is good. Uh, oh God, that's very loud, George. Look, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Thorsten Bell. I'm the director of the Resolution Foundation. And I just want to say we are on the microphone now very impressed that you have chosen to be here rather than burning in the park <laughs> with the rest of the world. The plus side is you've got a lower cancer risk uh, and you'll be better educated after the course of the next hour. We might even have a chat. Some of you got some tepid wine. Like, there's, there's not a lot else to be had in life, I'd have thought, than being here. So that's good. Now, what we're we here for, uh, we're here to talk about the labour market, like we often are, uh, and shifts in it. And we're going to try and do that while avoiding two kind of dangers of life. One of which we're calling the jaded policy making danger which is that, uh, and I've definitely done this, I'll give you a painful example in a second, which is uh, life's just so depressing that people keep telling you new and exciting things are going on in the world and your policy needs to adjust and you keep saying, yes, 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 but uh, we've got to do this other thing and you just ignore everything. Or there's the keeny beeny journalist danger, which is basically you hook onto some small shift and get massively overexcited. They're, both these things happen all the time. I've definitely personally done both. They're, but we're not going to do that uh, today. And to maybe help us like talk about the labour market and those shifts while avoiding those dangers, we have two authors and one expert. Uh, so on my right is James Bloodworth, who is a journalist. And his book, which I have here, is called Hired, Six Months Undercover in Low-Wage Britain which does basically what it says on the tin, with a quite a snazzy uh, title page. They're um, uh, taking us from Amazon to Uber via different parts of the uh, country. They, um, and then on my left, we have Jeremiah Sprossel, who is at Oxford University professor and has written Humans as a Service, The Promise and Perils of Work in the Gig Economy, which is about the gig economy. Uh, who'd have thought? It's also got a snazzy front page before you get upset. <laughs> and the good news is I'm told that both are available upstairs to buy from whatever a roving bookshop looks like. Is that true, Natalie? It is true. Fine, very good. Well, after you get excited by the next hour, then go and buy the books. This one's softback, it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> this one will be softback, buy it later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, it's fine, it's fine. Buy it on Kindle, sorry. even cheaper. Publishers will see outside. Okay, yeah. fine, sorry, sorry, sorry. But buy, buy two of it, one hardback, one softback. <laughs> Okay, right. Anyway, once we've stopped the commercial <laughs> chat, and then Kate Bell is head of economics at the TUC, uh, where they represent the workers so they can kind of tell us what they think is really going on. So that's who you've got to talk to. Uh, the order of play is James going to kick us off and tell, it, well, tell us what it was like following in the footsteps of George Orwell, where he went, what he found, what the state of the country is. Uh, and then we'll head over to Jeremiah, and then Kate's going to tell us what the truth is. So, James, over to you. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you, Torsten. Um, thank, thank you for coming um, as well. Um, you mentioned George Orwell. He, that, he was one of the reasons why I suppose um, I wrote the book. Um, he's the most famous example of um, this this type of book. Um, there have been many others. So more recently, Polly Toynbee did, did a similar book. Barbara Iron Reich in, in the United States, and prior to George Orwell. Um, people like Jack London, to some extent Henry Mayhew and James Greenwood. There's a, this long tradition of um, reporting on, on poverty and uh, low pay precarious employment um, by kind of immersing yourself in that world for a period of time and then coming back and um, sort of shoving, shoving it down the throats of, of middle class people, um, essentially. Um, so I hope to do that. And it was also for me, it was also about returning to, um, returning to, to a world in a way that I'd left a decade before. So I grew up in uh, Bridgewater and Burnham-on-Sea in Somerset. Um, I, I, I didn't go to university until I was 23. Um, I was the first in my family to go to university. And prior to that, I was kind of doing warehouse work, um, uh, laboring jobs, you know, bar work, petrol station, all those kinds of um, jobs I'd done. So it was, you know, 10 years later as a, as a, as a practicing journalist, I wanted to go back, um, as it were, and see how things had changed. Not only, um, not only, uh, you know, I now had the ability, the, like a degree of ability to write about those things and articulate some of the things that were going on there, but also in the ten years from kind of 2006 to to 2016, 
a great deal had changed in terms of uh, the economic picture. So you know you'd had the 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 biggest recession since since probably the 1930s. You'd had when I when I set out on the journey in 2016, there was a lot of there was a lot of kind of optimism in in the news around um, the employment figures. So record number of people in work, uh, Britain going back to work after a long uh, recession. Um, but the but the actual picture was more complicated. So behind that, there was a massive rise in uh, the number of people on zero hours contracts. There had been the the kind of appearance of this idea of the gig economy. So companies like Uber, Deliveroo, uh, this different model of work, which sold the idea of flexibility and autonomy. Um, so it was all, it was all about investigating the reality behind some of the kind of the language and and the the sort of things you see in the news. Um, so the first the plan was to kind of travel around the country um, and take you know a range of jobs jobs over six months and get a kind of rough 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 geographical spread in terms of where I went so that nowhere I went would be completely exceptional and no job I did would be completely out of the ordinary. Um, the first place I ended up was at Amazon in Rugeley, which was in, in Staffordshire. Um, they, they were advertising for jobs at the time through an agency called Transline. Um, Rugeley, I'd never, I'd never heard of the place before. It's kind of near Cannock Chase. Um, I ended up there, first of all, felt relatively easy to get a job with Amazon. Um, you know, you fill out a pile of forms, present some identification, and um, took a, take a drug and alcohol test, which was something I'd never had to do for, for a job before, which was, was perhaps interesting in itself. Um, so I got, got this job at Amazon, which I did for a month. Um, the job entailed kind of, you know, I'd walk around 10 miles every day. I'd do four days a week on a zero hours contract, but each shift was, my shifts were typically 10 and a half hours um, a day. Um, and it was a fairly bleak, um, I mean, you'd expect warehouse work to be quite, not to be like a really kind of joyful experience, but it was much worse than anything I'd done um, in the past. So I'd worked in a warehouse, um, you know, a decade before, um, and it was, you know, it was it was quite quite bleak. But but Amazon, it was it was on a completely different level. So, on the one hand, there were was the, the way in which Amazon and the agencies which which took people on would flat would essentially flat employment law. So, I interviewed one young woman who'd worked at Amazon who was paid um, one week. She was paid the equivalent of sixty two pence an hour, and it took six weeks to claw the money back um, because her mum was threatening to kind of go to ACAS. Um, I was paid below the minimum wage for half the time I worked there due to incompetency on the, on the part of the agencies employed by Amazon. Um, other things though, just a kind of daily humiliation of, of the job. So uh, if you were off sick, if you took a day off sick, uh, you'd receive a disciplinary for it. Even if you got, had a note from the doctors, even if you phoned in you know, three hours before, the requisite number of hours beforehand, um, you'd receive a disciplinary. And when you queried that, they would say, well, this is what Amazon have always done. Um, you know, it's a bit like in school being told, you know, because I said so. There's, there's no kind of, there's not, that's not a reason, you know, it's, it, that's, that's authority talking. Um, and there, there were lots and lots of kind of small assaults on, you know, causes of material poverty and kind of a lack of dignity in the work. But, it, but I mean, the more, the more time I spent, I was also living in Rugeley, and the more time I spent there, um, it became apparent that, um, you know, the work I was doing, it was, it was happening in a context where in that town you'd had several, several decades before, you'd had skilled work. You'd had work with strong trade unions. You'd had work where it did provide a sense of progression from one year to the next. So you could get a mortgage, you could support a family. Um, so 20, two, two decades before Amazon arrived in, in 2011, uh, the Lee Hall Colliery had closed. And that had been the, previously the biggest employer um, in the town. And when I arrived, Amazon was the biggest employer in the town, followed by uh, Tesco and Argos. And all of the entry-level roles at those companies, it was all zero hours contracts, all minimum wage. And uh, many people I speak to, so I, I wanted to read very, very short extracts from someone I spoke to in the town who kind of, what he said to me, it kind of encapsulated uh, a way many people felt about the town was in decline. So like many other towns in Britain, especially, particularly formerly industrial areas, um, as, as, as bad as many of the old jobs were, you know, you don't want to romanticise coal, coal mining. You can die underground, you're not going to die in the, in the Amazon warehouse. But something had been lost with those, with those jobs, the kind of institutional affiliations, the trade union movement, the social clubs. Um, and people felt, um, repeatedly, people I'd meet felt like the, the town was in decline. And remember, this is in 2016, prior to Brexit. 
Um, and it was a similar story when I was in South Wales uh, later in the year. So, I mean, this, this guy, Jeff, I, I met in the social club, he said, you know, if you want good employment, you've got to become a commuter. Um, you've got to commute out of this town to find the real jobs today, whatever the real jobs uh, are. And then he began to talk about the past. So he said, you know, the thing is, you go from pit to power station, you're talking about skilled, skilled jobs, apprenticeships and all this. This town had this since the 60s. Um, you know, power station, good jobs, good money. And in 2016, what are we becoming as a town? Realistically, we're becoming poorer as a town uh, than we were 50 years ago. So yeah, you'd, you'd had the, 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 the coal mine, two power stations, Thorny MI, Armitage Shanks had been replaced by Amazon, followed by uh, Tesco and then Argos. So you had this sense of being working, to, be, to kind of, to, to lead a, a fulfilling life and materially prosperous life, you had to essentially commute out of the town or escape by going to university. So more people go to university, um, but if you're left behind, there was a sense that you'd kind of uh, failed essentially. Um, and there was, it, was, it was much harder than in the past to find a route to uh, meaningful working class employment where you could, could derive a sense of dignity from that. I mean, someone, um, a former colleague said to me one, one night um, when we, we were having a drink and he said, um, you know, people, people I see around town, they say, I'm only at Amazon. I only work at Amazon. I only work at Amazon. And he said, you know, we would have never said, I only work down the pit because, it, because you were a collier and you were proud of that. Um, and I wouldn't have even, you know, I hadn't even thought of, thought of that before when I set out for the book. But it was something that the book did throw up more generally was, I'd say, not, it's not just the material poverty of, of many of these jobs. It's the, the sense of indignity um, that... You, the sense of kind of the loss of, of any sort of control over your own destiny that in the past perhaps you had through, through things like the trade union movement, through small organisations where you had a kind of a sense of, of democracy and um, asserting yourself, you know, in a world where um, today in places like Rugeley, um, you're basically, you're, you're buffeted from pillar to post on the whims of your, your employer. Um, how long have I got left? A few minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, that was, that was the first place I went and I've used it as kind of a case study. Uh, from from Rugeley, I was in, also in Blackpool where I worked as a social carer. That was, um, that was probably the hardest job in some respects because you have the, the emotional side as well as the physical side of the work. Um, but it was basically a care system where, as, as one carer put it to me, uh, the, the, the carers are treated like glorified cleaners, she said. Um, you know, no disrespect to cleaners, but considering the responsibility that many care workers had to do, um, there was there was no there wasn't really a, a kind of just reward for the work they did, and then that had a knock-on impact on the people you were looking after. Um, so you know, twenty-minute care visits, um, doing kind of uh, you know, taking someone to the bathroom, making them a meal, giving them a bath, putting them to bed, getting them out of bed, um, administering medicine, and you had to do all of these things very often within a twenty-minute window. Um, so mistakes creep in. You know, people. I, when I was working for for this this company. Um, Medicine sheets weren't filled out, so someone gives someone medicine, then the next person comes in on their shift, sees the sheet not filled out, then gives the medicine again. So you effectively, you're effectively poisoning someone who then ends up in uh, at A and E, and all because we don't put enough money into the system, and yet you end up paying again um, more in the long term um, when people rock up at the GPs or or the the A and E. Uh, from there, I went to South Wales, which was very similar to. Um, to Rugeley in some ways, but it was more bleak. So since, the, since industry left in the 80s and 90s, you've had many of the kind of, the legacy is still there. So if you go to somewhere like Ebba Vale, you know, a, 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 you know, several decades ago, this was a very proud town which produced, you know, the steel for the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, and now you have, have five food banks within, I think it's 40 square miles or something. Um, you have one in six people taking out prescriptions for antidepressants. Um, you have you know, a much higher rate of, of people on uh, incapacity benefit, much higher rate of child poverty than, than most other parts of the country. And it's to basically to do with work. Um, and then from the, I've kind of racing, racing through the book a bit at this point, my final like, leg was in, was in London with the gig economy. And one thing I kind of noticed just to kind of sum up with, with, with something that, that was a feature of the gig economy, which kind of encapsulated the, the book as a whole in a way. There was this big kind of, as soon as I, I got interested in driving for Uber, I was bombarded with this, with this vocabulary of around liberation, around autonomy, around flexibility. 
Um, but you soon realise that there, as with, as with traditional forms of employment, there are different interests at play. Um, so behind this kind of, um, you know, uh, this, this language around freedom, um, there was, there was a, f a more familiar form of exploitation going on. Um, and we weren't really our own bosses when I was working for Uber. We were, we were very clearly controlled tightly by the company. Um, but this, this kind of, uh, this public relations around freedom and autonomy had been used to kind of um, deprive us of, of many rights that had previously been won uh, by the labor movement. And I think that, that, that goes for some of the other industries um, as a whole. You have this, um, we have this idea of technology and you know, this idea of inevitability in the future, you know, we're moving to this world, you know, you can't be stuck in the past. But I think technology is neither, you know, it's, it's technology is, is, is kind of neutral in this. It's still about different interests. And it's still about kind of recognizing that, you know, flexibility, but flexibility for whom? And, and those old questions, I think, about, you know, whether it's in the workers' interest to, to, to do these things or, or whether it's just in the, in the company's interest. I think that's, um, that's where I'd like to finish. Great. Thank you very much, James. <laughs> Just before you start boozing, the, um, uh, the, um, like when you're listening to hear you talking through those different case studies, until you got to Uber, um, it sounded like your book is as much a story about place as it is about work, whereas the Uber story sounds much more like it's actually a straight, what's the job? Is that, is it, did you intend it to end up as a place? Um, no, I, I mean, when I set out, it was it was really a book about that was about kind of rogue employers and, you know, um, well, kind of about like what it's like to, you know, in, exist on that that wage in, in the low pay economy. And, you know, our companies adhering to the law. So work for as many, many companies as you can and just see what the picture is in terms of, you know, pulling back the, 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 the curtain, as it were. But then uh, spending time within the towns, it, it became increasingly important to put some context to the job itself. So. You know, you're working at Amazon, but what does that mean if you've if you've been if you've always lived in this town and this is now the biggest employer? What does that mean in terms of your kind of your life, your outlook on life? Um, and especially when it was 2016, there was this idea around taking back control. I mean, you can see, you know, there are many reasons in some of these places to want to take take back control. And so I began to think more and more about uh, the localities and um, you know, I was in the bubble before prior to that myself to some extent. You know, in London, kind of. Journalism is increasingly, you have the Twitter feed open and you just, uh, it's like Should gossip. Banned. Yeah. <laughs> Single-handedly causes That is one technology crisis. we ban, yeah. Yeah, it is um, stopping. Francis, are you doing Twitter now? <laughs> <laughs> it's very unproductive. What about gender? Because the only thing, I, when I hear you talk about place and things is, a lot of the change you're talking about is about the change in the jobs that white men did 30 years ago and that lower qualified white men do now. And that is clearly it all the data you don't you, you lived experience and the data just shows very clearly you've got you know uh, men, young men in Manchester earning the same as young men in Manchester 20 years ago you can see that very clearly in all the data the gender pay gap is being closed by men's pay falling the um, uh, but the flip side of that is women are doing better jobs than they were there's more than working but they're also there's occupational upskilling in general of women and downskilling of men so some of it some of this is about a fair gender sharing of good and bad work the, um... Yeah, I mean, there's there's a thread though running from. I mean, the flip side of that, in a way, there's a thread running from the the kind of the the loss of, of trade union strength in places like uh, South Wales, where I mean, I interviewed a, a former colleague there who'd been out on strike against Margaret Thatcher in, in 1984, and one thing he said to me really stuck with me. It was, you know, when we were on strike, he said lots of people didn't give a damn, but it's affected everyone that's working up to this day. And then I was in Blackpool prior to that. Oh, explain that. Oh, explain that. What was he trying to say? So he was saying that you know the 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 the, the kind of erosion of trade union power yep. has affected um, people in work even today. Even the kind of the so kind no of no one cared. No one else cared while they were having their rights taken away. No. Case. So I mean, not no one cared, but many people you know didn't think it concerned them um, when when union rights were being eroded in the 1980s, and it's affected everyone everyone to this day. And then so I was prior to that I was in Blackpool in. A, a very female-dominated workforce, so the care sector. Eighty percent of the workers are women, and they were they. You know, it was a real struggle. It was a, there was a huge turnover of staff year upon year. Many women in, mostly women in precarious, uh, low-paid employment, um, where they were disciplined using things like zero-hours contracts. So if they whistle blew about something that went on in 
the care sector. Because you can't sack someone for doing that, because you'll be up before an employment tribunal, they'll just cut your hours down on a zero hours contract. And, and they can do that. It's, it's a method to discipline people. So, I mean, the... You don't want to be nostalgic for this world where, you know, the, the women are at home while the men are in, spending all their money in the social club. But at the same time, you can see how um, the, the erosion of, of things like trade union power, um, it, it affects all of us. It affects, um, you know, it, it affected the women in the care sector I was working with just as much as it, was, as it, as it had affected some of the, the, the guys who were working in Amazon. OK, great. Now, Jeremiah, this gig economy thing, is it good or bad? I, I think it's both very much. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the things that sort of fascinated me about the gig economy when I first came to the topic was that you had these completely different narratives about it out there, right? I mean, this starts with the title of the book. I guess that's a sort of awkward confession to make for an academic, but I plagiarised the title of the book um, from a lecture by Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame because even though we sort of focus a lot on discussion about Amazon on the warehouses, the reality is that the vast majority of Amazon's profits actually comes from the online world, it comes from things called Amazon Web Services, things like selling out computer processing power, selling out storage space online. And in sort of geek tech speak, that's often referred to as processing as a service or storage as a service. And so just over 10 years ago at a lecture at MIT, Jeff Bezos goes on to talk about the future of Amazon and where he sort of really sees the company going and the profits coming from. And he says that the vision is to sell humans as a service. And that sort of struck a, a slightly discordant chord with me as an employment lawyer, because the very first thing we teach in every employment law course is the Declaration of Philadelphia, the sort of founding instrument of the International Labour Organization, where the story is the opposite one, where the, all the countries agree that labour is not a commodity. And it was that sort of clash between those two visions, humans as a service versus labour is not a commodity, that first started to get me thinking about the gig economy. That sounds quite bad. Where's the good bit? Well, that, <laughs> we're, we're still getting there, because then you start reading these stories, right? And, and you start reading the articles in newspapers, books about the gig economy, and you get these two starkly contrasting narratives, which the book sort of explores in the early chapters. On the one hand, it's sold to us as the future of work. On the other, it's sold as this sort of return to medieval exploitation. And the interesting thing is that I think there's some truth in both of these narratives. So when you think about the future of work narrative first, that tends to centre about two stories, one of innovation and one of entrepreneurship. And what's not to like about those two things, right? Every government, every society, we would want to have as much entrepreneurship, as much innovation as possible, right? So entrepreneurship, this is the idea of flexibility. James already talked about, right? That you can choose when you want to work, how you want to work, what you want to do. No more of the sort of nine to five job in the factory or in the office with the boss breathing down your neck, right? And that's great. If the, if the elements, the extent to which that's true, it's brilliant. And you've got good stories about labor market activation. People who've been sort of structurally completely excluded from the labor market can suddenly use some of these platforms to find a way back into work. Right? That's true in the case of Uber, for example, in Bon de Bonlieu in France. That's a very well-documented story of people who've just been structurally excluded from the labour market, who can suddenly work again. Or think about some of the online platforms like Upwork or Amazon Mechanical Turk. Right? You've got a hideous tattoo in your face or a criminal record. That's a mile long. Good, even a good tattoo. Even a good tattoo, <laughs> yes. It could be hard to find some jobs. And online, when you're hiding behind the platform, actually, you can suddenly find work again, earn money, and you know, maybe even find some of that identity back. And it's interesting, you know, you talk about identity. Some of these online platforms, which you might think are sort of the ultimate dystopian vision of just sitting lonely at home. Well, on some of these online fora that the workers create, whether it's Facebook groups or chat groups, actually they do create those identities. And some of that sort of collective spirit is actually coming back through the internet. And it's not just sort of entrepreneurship that's the narrative. It's also about innovation, right? This use of technology to save some of the oldest problems in the labor market. Matching, historically, right? Pissaridis got his Nobel Prize for showing that actually there's a real inefficiency in the labor market. If I'm looking to employ somebody here in London and somebody in Oxford is looking to do work, well, it's going to be nearly impossible for us to find each other. Now, using clever algorithms, using GPS stamps to create that match in the labor market is great for everybody. It's great for the people looking for work, and it's great for the people who are looking to employ people. And using that sort of technology, using that innovation, is also good for consumers, right? Things like having the feedback mechanism, knowing the sort of quality of the work that you're going to, to receive is good. And 
I think for consumers, probably the most important thing, at least in the short run, prices are, are lower as well. So I think that's the good story, right? That's the narrative of... So of Jeff Bezos today. is bad and the innovation is good. Uh, again, no, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> I say Jeff, Jeff Bezos is you bad, uh, just, just for, uh, for live purposes. But there, there's the second narrative <laughs> yep. um, as well. And that's when we sort of start scrutinizing both innovation and entrepreneurship more carefully. A second sort of strand, a second element of the picture emerges. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, I think whilst for some people, for some workers, some platforms, that story is true. When the flexibility becomes too one-sided, it quickly becomes insecurity, right? Try working for a ride-sharing service and saying, well, I'm flexibly going to choose to drive on Mondays from 9.30 to 11.30 and from 2.30 to 4.30, right? Good luck making a living out of that. The reality is you're going to have to be in Soho on a Friday evening if you really want to make um, the money. Same sort of thing is true with a lot of the online labor platforms, right? You have to work, for example, mostly to US East Coast Times, because that's where a lot of the tasks are posted, where a lot of the work is. And it's not just about the flexibility, it's also about this sort of entrepreneurial freedom to choose what you want to do. Because the reality is that very often that algorithm that's sold to us as this sort of clever matchmaking thing actually ends up doing much more than just the matchmaking, ends up being a boss. And a boss that you know, would make Frederick Taylor blush with how exacting it is in terms of its control. Right? That's the story of some ride-sharing companies using the accelerometer in your iPhone to measure how quickly what? you accelerate. What's in our iPhone? You know that thing when you turn your screen? What's it called? And it tells you it's an accelerometer. Accelerometer. And they can use that to measure how hard you brake and how quickly you accelerate. You drive too abruptly, well, your rating goes down. Right? A lot of online platforms ask you to install a little plug-in on your computer that takes a screenshot at random yeah. intervals. This is euphemistically sometimes referred to as the work diary, which the consumer, when you actually get somebody to do the work, the consumer can then check in <laughs> random intervals what you've been doing. Not, not to give you any ideas about how you're going to deal with the resolution foundation. The team around the back are thinking this uh, is not uh, going well. At least three it? ideas you've given me now for uh, <laughs> this idea. productivity needs rising people. And there's, there's other problems with things like, so um, another big sort of emerging field of research is about what we call algorithmic discrimination. This idea that actually a lot of sort of unconscious biases when it comes to rating consumers, when it comes to rating workers, can actually be reflected and sort of, you know, made much more powerful through these algorithms. Where suddenly, again, you have the exact opposite effect of labor market activation. Key groups can be excluded from access to the labor market. So that's sort of challenging the, the entrepreneurship narrative. There's also some stuff to think harder about the innovation narrative. And that's what I sort of have ended up writing about as the innovation paradox. And that's essentially the idea that even though we're seeing a lot of really cool technology being used here, in terms of the apps, in terms of the matching algorithms, the underlying reality of the business model is actually an ancient one. So I ended up doing what's really dangerous for a lawyer and ended up trying to write some sort of historical bits, going looking at you know, the way dock labor was organized. Mayhew, who you've already mentioned, right? he writes about the way London port labor is organized. And you can compare that to some stories in the gig economy. Tell us a bit about that, given that not everybody's worked on the docks in the room. So it's this idea that essentially, rather than having a job, a sort of open-ended, stable relationship, you take these jobs and you break them down into tasks. And then you've got really powerful middlemen, the stevedores in the ports, the foggers in sort of the homework output industry. And they are the ones who are in charge of distributing those tasks across the workforce, often very short term. Right? So in the docks, it used to be only for half a day. So there was this thing called the shape-up, where the men, and, and they were only men at that particular point in time, would wait and sort of compete with each other to be assigned the first half day's work. And then at lunchtime, the whole thing was repeated again. Right? And you were talking earlier about sort of how zero hours contracts can be used to actually exert control and sanction work. Well, it's exactly that same sort of principle. And so I think the interesting point then there is that we have to be very careful to sort of divvy apart what was a genuine you know, technology business, which is something like you know, Facebook. That wouldn't have existed without technology. That is not a business that existed 10, 15 years ago. And keep that apart from other companies that essentially are using a traditional business model, but are using technology in really innovative ways within the context of that business model. Instead of a ledger book to dispatch your taxes, where I have to book it a week in advance, and I have an algorithm that does it instantly. Now, that's better in many ways, but it doesn't fundamentally change the underlying business model. And I guess that then gets us to the point of sort of, you know, what should we do about it? Yeah. And what should the regulatory response be? And 
quite often I think I sort of disappoint policymakers and governments I work with a bit because they expect me to come in and have my sort of blueprint for the gig economy law or you know the new work in the modern technology. Is that not the last chapter? It's always the last. <laughs> that is always the last chapter. It's sadly not. That's chapter five called disrupting the disruptors. Oh right, okay. But actually the story is about saying it's about enforcing existing laws. It's about having a level playing field. It's about saying, actually, we really want you as a business to go out and use technology and experiment with it, try to improve your work processes, but you have to stick to the same rules as everybody else. Just because you use technology instead of your old ledger book doesn't mean that we get to reinvent the wheel and we get to have some you know, calls for new regulation or new reforms. It's not a question of forbidding you know, the gig economy or outlawing the platforms. It's saying everybody's got to play by the same rules. So give us some concrete examples of what that would mean. So for example, um, just by being a technology company doesn't mean you don't have to comply with minimum wage legislation. If you employ somebody for an hour, you have to pay them for an hour, whether you are the boss standing behind them, breathing down their neck, or whether you've got an algorithm doing it. And the fascinating thing is that, again, this is not just a question of protecting the workers. This is actually really good, the level playing field, that is, for consumers. Something goes wrong, suddenly you've got recourse again. But it's also for sort of the economy at large, because if you look at the historical evidence, it's clear that a labour market in which labour costs nothing or is very cheap is really harmful for innovation and productivity. Again, you found these historical amazing stories of sort of, you know, in Yorkshire in, in about 120, 130 years ago, mill owners who've invested in automated spinning looms complaining bitterly to Parliament about being undercut by rogue operators who still use women and children at home to do this work and therefore can offer it much more cheaply than the people who've sort of, you know, undertaken the capital investment. So actually this level playing field is a story not just of protecting the workers, creating that sort of basic law of protection again, but also, it's a story of innovation, of consumers okay. and protection. Great, Jeremiah. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> now, Kate, Jeremiah ended on a big argument for higher wages, which I reckon the TUC is kind of net pro. <laughs> They're on balance. They're, um, but what do you guys? What do you think is going on? Um, so I, I just wanted to start by saying these are two really, really great books, Don't which I really them. enjoyed, and you should buy them. And I thought I'd just induce you to buy them that. by giving you um, my favourite quote from each of them. So Jeremiah, I think, is quoting somebody else, but says, um, millennial entrepreneurs are coming to disrupt real-world laws and regulations in the same way that stealing your dog is disrupting the idea of pet ownership, <laughs> which I particularly enjoyed. Um, and James, I'm afraid this is not quite so topical, but at some point you did reassure me that life is crap, so get drunk is not a bad motto. Um, I seem to have underlined <laughs> in like one nine, of oh my yeah. pages like an of your book, which is... Pop song, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I liked. Okay, <laughs> but more seriously, I think both books are, make a really great case, basically, that um, what this is going on here is a shift of power away from workers and towards employers. And we know employment law sets this out very clearly, um, economic theory sets this out very clearly, but also the reality of most of our working lives, that we have an unequal relationship between workers and the people who employ them. Over time, we've developed some kind of bargain between them. So we say we have an organisation, normally a firm, in which we say, OK, we recognise there needs to be some kind of sharing of risk and responsibility, basically. So employees decide to come into work every day um, to perform a set of tasks that employers ask them to. In return, it's recognised that if you go sick, the employer might pick up some of those costs or share picking up some of those costs with the state. It's recognised that you might basically that you're a human being even while you're in work, so you may need to take breaks, that there may be times between jobs. So rather than saying, OK, well, you log off when you're not working or if you need to stare out the window for five minutes, for example, in order to gather your thoughts for your next task, I never do that. Um, <laughs> then, you know, you are still paid during that period. And I think what we've seen and I think what both books really bring out really, caref really clearly is an increasing attempt by employers to say, actually, we're not really willing to take those risks on from you. We're going to shift those back to workers and we're certainly not going to pay you for any time in which you're not at your maximum productivity. And I think what they both show us is we do need a shift in that power balance back towards the workers. And I just thought I'd talk really briefly about kind of three types of power where we might think this is fundamentally about a shift in power. And often when it comes to solutions, there's kind of different ways we think about that. And I think three of them really come out from this book. 
So first of all, you have the kind of fundamental power of the state as regulator, and I think Jeremiah has really clearly set out that we do need better enforcement of the existing law. The law is kind of our main tool for deciding how we distribute that risk between employers and um, workers, and at the moment, as you say, the law simply isn't being enforced. Um, without wanting to go too much into kind of death by policy wonk, we obviously do think there are areas where the law needs to be improved. Um, we would ban zero hours contracts. We don't think that's an acceptable form of work. Um, we think there's kind of innovative legal mechanisms you could use, which also Joe Myers has talked about, where you say, well, who's actually economically benefiting from this? So if, for example, you've employed some of the Amazon workers you talk to are employed by an agency, at the moment, if they want to take a case around their minimum wage violations, for example, they're not being paid, they have to go through the agency, they have to find out if the agency hasn't paid them. Actually, it's Amazon who's benefiting from their labour, Amazon are the people who should really be responsible for those shifts. So we call this joint and several liability, but it basically means the person who's benefiting from the labour should be the person who says, your rights have to be enforced. And there's also big loopholes holes in the law at the moment that allow agency workers to be paid less and it's quite welcome that the government's consulting on that at the moment and anyone here who wants to do some lobbying of government ending the Swedish derogation is something you could be asking for right now and government maybe might actually do. Um, so you've got kind of the power of the state as kind of enforcer, regulator basically. Then you've got a kind of power of the state as kind of convener, exhorter, kind of nudger, shover maybe and a range of things they could be doing here. So you've got, um, we've asked the government in its industrial strategy, they're starting to say, maybe we could have employers coming together to look at this. Well, why aren't they also saying, why can't we tackle some of those labour abuses in this kind of conversation? I think there's something actually about the state just talking about this, about politicians saying, we don't think regulatory arbitrage is a positive form of innovation. Actually just pointing out that, you know, a lot of what you were talking about doesn't look like positive innovation that improves productivity. It looks like innovation which drives down workers' rights. And I think you call it double speak in the book. And actually kind of calling some of that out and just saying, we don't think this is particularly, um, you know, this doesn't look like innovation and it's not what we, the kind of businesses we want to compete to have in the UK. And then, of course, there's a huge role for tax policy, too, and we can get into the debates about that, but at the moment, <laughs> we won't get into the debates about that. But, you know, the state's role as tax in kind of saying what type of employment it wants to encourage is pretty important. But then, obviously, and you'd expect me to talk, in, talk about this, the third, and we think probably the most important form of power is workers' actual bargaining power. And I think, James, you'll have found in your experience, you know, the ability to speak up as an individual and say... Uh, I don't really like this, I don't think this is okay, leads to the risk of victimisation, it leads to the risk of, as you said, being zeroed down on those zero hours contracts. And that's why collective workers' power has always been at kind of the base of how we organise and tackle these abuses of labour rights. Um, and I guess for trade unions, and I think this is something prompted by James's book, you know, you talk quite a lot about the decline of trade unions in some of these areas. There is, of course, a big piece of self-reflection for us there, you know, I don't. I think the trade union movement and there's colleagues in the room for there would probably all of us accept that we haven't been quick enough at getting into some of these new forms of workplaces. That we're trying hard to adapt to the changing world of work, but that it's been difficult and we haven't always been kind of innovative enough in how we reach young workers. I think you're certainly seeing that realization um, there. I think you're starting to see some really kind of exciting practice in changing, whether that's, you know, it was trade unionists who brought the case against Uber, which actually kicked off quite a lot of this discussion about the gig economy. Um, I think you've seen some really interesting things going on at McDonald's, actually, where although they're not recognized, you have seen McDonald's actually interestingly, coincidentally putting up their minimum wage and saying they would use the use of zero hours contracts at the same time as young workers were organising strikes. And the TUC has got our own programme of thinking about how we organise young workers. And I think one of the interesting things about that, hopefully, we're launching it in June, will be that it's been very much co-created with workers in the type of place that James was working in during this period. And we've been out to talk to them to say, what are the barriers to you organising? Why is it difficult? and how can we help. But I think we also do need to recognise that some of the decline in union power was actually part of a deliberate strategy to tilt power away from workers, whether that was through ideological reasons, a kind of political motivation, and you talked about the 80s and, you know, attempts to smash the trade unions, or whether that was 
because of sort of possibly a more benign belief that union power was a kind of barrier to innovation and labour market flexibility. But, you know, whether it was dismantling wage councils in the 80s or to the Trade Union Act that was really not very long ago in 2016, where we saw basically a deliberate attempt by government to limit the power of workers organising, this was actually a strategy. And I think when we think about these types of work, we need to recognise that there were political decisions made as well as kind of, you know, shifts in technology, shifts in how we responded to that. And I think making sure that we recognise that and think of the political response to it as well as the technical responses, which I'm happy to talk about at great length, um, will be really important in actually doing something about this. That's great. Thank you very much, Kate. And for holding back from all the technical stuff, that is like... There's uh, more. There's, there's more to come, people. You can grab Kate afterwards. She's available for about five hours. Yeah, it will be great. Why don't we, just before we open up for questions, just, just on... Why don't you give both of us, each give us reflections on one of the things that you've kind of identified in your books, the issues, the trends in the labour market, how much those are trends that are a big deal and deeply felt, but for a small part of the labour market, or how much do you feel like the things you're talking about are actually to do with large, the majoritarian large chunks of it, and then what you actually want done about it? James? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I finished the book with... Um, almost a quote from a, it's a quote from a trade unionist, um, Jason Moyer Lee. Um, so who's who's the, who's part of the trade union which have have helped to bring the case um, against Uber? And he says that um, you know I've I've laid out a book talking about you know how bad it is that that you know a section of the population, a minority of the population, as it were, you know the work uh, the rump of the working class are being treated this way. And the book ends with him warning that. You know, it's not just about the person who delivers your, your pizza with the, the delivery like rider. This stuff is spreading. So we have to nip some of this stuff in the bud now um, because otherwise it will be middle class jobs as well, which I mean, from a purely self-interested point of view, um, there's, there's an argument to say that um, like gig work has spread to my own profession, to, to journalism. It's now um, as a freelancer, you're expected to increasingly do things more and more for, you know, exposure. Um, there are more and more uh, outlets which won't pay you uh, for the work uh, that you're doing um, or will pay, you know, a rate that's, you know, much lower than, than you would have perhaps got in the past. Now, on the one hand, there are, there are obviously, you know, bigger kind of forces which are playing a role there. But there's also people who are willing to step in and then exploit those forces and use that to kind of uh, tip the balance back towards um, bosses as opposed to workers. Um, so I forgot where the hell I'm, I'm going with this point I think you've given now. us the answer. But, um, it's but, I, I, but I think it's that's... It's either affecting you now or it's coming for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not... You can't just kind of inoculate... Um, you know, you can't just... If you're, if you're a member of the middle class, you can't just inoculate yourself against this, this erosion of terms and conditions. So there's a moral point to kind of not wanting to see someone being paid 62 pence a week. I mean, I would hope we would all not want to think that someone's being put through that when you order something from Amazon. But there's also a point where, you know, I want to live in a society where that isn't going to be my job tomorrow as well. That's great. And then in terms of, to give us a bit of uplift, what about, what would you like to see change? Um, okay, I mean, enforcement's a really good point because it sounds like something really small, um, but then, Things like, I mean, David Metcalf, who's head of enforcement at HMRC, he, he like made a joke at, at some select committee, I think it was last year, or it may have been 2016, where he said that, you know, a, a business can expect a visit from enforcement once every 500 years. I mean, that's not funny when you're on, you know, when you're, you're being paid below the minimum wage and it means you're going to like a payday lender or something. Um, so I don't think it's not taken seriously in the way that, say, um, benefit, you know, benefit fraud, you'll see the poster up, you know, shopping, shop your neighbour for, 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 for claiming benefits, you know, benefit fraud. Yet there's no, there's no equivalent within workplaces where uh, you either have a union rep, if you have a, a union in that workplace, or you have, you know, a, a very simple, you know, phone this number if, if to report if you're not being paid, paid the minimum wage. And then HMRC comes down on them like a, like a ton of bricks. And the other kind of bigger philosophical uh, change I think we need to make is we need as a society to not just um, we obsess around social mobility, which I mean, in, in some respects, that's, you know, that's, that's good. If you want to kind of better yourself, we should, we should put the things in place to do that. Um, if you want to, you know, get an education, go to university. But there's also, you know, people who, who, who want to stay in the town where they grew up, people who, who you know, uh, do, do kind of manual jobs or whatever. 
they they do, we should we should as a society we should we should spend much uh, as much money on on people like that so they can create build a decent lives for themselves instead of purely telling them that the only way to kind of gain any sort of self respect is to is to leave that town is to is to escape basically and um, you know that we have to also we have to put dignity back in uh, to working class work is is what I would say. Great. The, um, Jeremiah, it's on this gig economy stuff. So there are a lot of books. Are you sure there aren't more books on the gig economy than gig economy work? <laughs> <laughs> Just putting that out there. Even though yours is the best of them all. Well, how, I, how big a deal I wouldn't subscribe really? to either of those judgments. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure about books. Certainly journalistic articles. Right. Um, that, 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 that has been said before. I mean, one of my very senior colleagues in the law faculty in Oxford, when I first revealed to them that, that I'd signed the contract to write this book, um, sort of instantly replied saying, why on earth would you waste your time doing that? <laughs> um, there's absolutely nothing new in this, right? So going, going back to this question, and at first I was sort of, you know, Bit, bit put back, uh, admittedly, and, and these supportive bits. colleague. Was worth. But, but actually, to some extent, I've come round to that that point of view, right? And it's there's sort of the there's nothing new here story. Um, it's not just that it's nothing new story here. It's also one of even if the gig economy is only one or two or three percent, I think I think it's still fair to say that best UK estimates say that the NHS employs more people Definitely. than the gig economy, right? Yet nobody goes around and has you know future of the NHS work panels and you know governments around the world don't, don't and the RCN do that. The RCN <laughs> do that a lot of that. Um, so, but the, the thing then is that the sort of the underlying problems, the intermittency of the work, the multilateral employment relationships, actually things we do see all over the place. Now that said, there is one thing that is different here or that's sort of interesting, and that's the role of technology in the workplace, right? Because what's going on here to some extent is a question of, of hiding work or sort of you know, repackaging work as entrepreneurship or something else that's not legally protected. Mm -hmm. And I was told that one is not normally allowed to have slides, but I have managed to, to wedge to one secretly oh, on in. Then, on then. Let's have it. And, and I think I've got this one slide here, which I talk about right on the very first page of the book. Anybody come across this down. before? Yeah. This is a chess computer. This is the very first machine in the world that could play chess. Introduced at, in 1770 at the court of Maria Therese in Vienna. Right? You sort of wind the thing up. What did it do? And then it actually played chess. So you, you, you have you a human play, play on one side, it plays, it plays and then the, the robot played against, played against you, right? And then people always said, this is a hoax, but no, you could open it up, and you could sort of see the technology, and sort of candles were passed around, that you could see was all the fancy technology doing the work. Played Napoleon Bonaparte when he went on a tour sort of the grand court of, of Europe, uh, that the chess took three times until Napoleon uh, uh, lost it. Okay. So <laughs> how do we do this 240 years before, you know, Kasparov plays, uh, plays Deep Blue? Well, as ever in life, if it's too good to be true, it, it, it probably isn't. Quite literally hidden behind the technology, hidden behind all those sort of dials and wheels and things, there was a little box with a tiny little person sitting by candlelight moving the chess pieces above oh, that's his so head. Depressing. <laughs> it's depressing, it's clever. Whatever you might want to make of it, it's no coincidence, perhaps, that Amazon chooses this hoax as the branding for their online labor platform, which is called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Tagline, artificial, artificial intelligence. Very good. And so the story, I think, also the takeaway point here is that technology is great. Right? I think technology unequivocally makes work better, safer, more productive, more fun. But at the same time, we have to be super careful that when we interact with the gig economy through the beautiful apps, through the sort of smooth software, we don't forget the fact that at the end of the day, somebody somewhere is sitting in a little box and doing the work. And that has to be the starting point for our regulatory inquiries. And if you've got a candle in a little box, that is a fire risk. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from anything else. <laughs> That's... <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, hey, what is it? What, Colin? How big a deal is this? Are you talking when 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 trade unionists are on TV saying it's all a disaster, works awful, pays low? How much how much are we talking about the labour market as a whole, and how much are you angsting about the bottom of it? Well, I think um, I wish I had a slide as beautiful as that and no a metaphor does. as beautiful as that to talk about. But um, I mean, pay. You know, real pay has been in crisis for a decade, basically um, across the whole economy, and that applies to everybody. Um, 
Obviously, some of this kind of poor quality work is restricted to, you know, people on lower pay. But I think the kind of fundamental concept of seeing this shift in the shift in risk transferred from the employer to the individual, where you can most see it across the labour market, is actually in pensions. Now, I'm following a beautiful slide with talking about pensions, but you have seen this big shift in where pensions used to be a collective responsibility, where employers would promise to pay you a defined benefit pension at the end of your career, and they would bear the risk for if the stock market didn't meet those returns, it would be the employer who bought that risk. We're now seeing a transfer to um, defined contract pensions, basically, which means that you as the individual bear the risk. And actually, if you see quite a lot of union activism, this is what the UCU, the lecturers strike was all about over the last few weeks, was about that risk where it was saying the employer is no longer going to say this is a partnership between us and you as the worker, you put in the time, we bear some of that financial risk. They're saying, sorry, you're on your own. You and the market, can mit you can mitigate that risk through the market, but we won't help you do that. And I think that's typical of what we're seeing in these situations where increasingly it's like you're not in, t in you know, the benefit for you having given your labour to this organisation is not protection against risk, it's an additional form of risk or you are in a market-based system in which you, which you navigate those risks of life, of the market itself, on your own. And I think that possibly tells us that this kind of attempted shift isn't just something that's happened. We see it kind of very visibly at the lower end of the labour market, but it's something that's actually happened it's across the board. It's even got to academics. It must be very serious. Actually, academics suffer really badly from casualisation. Oh my God, okay, oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, right, okay, it's special pleading. Even the <laughs> academics not making the pleading. Well, no, it is. It is. Don't start. <laughs> you want some questions? Let's have, we, don't we, need... we talk about the gig economy coming yeah. to be worked, it's right? And to... I think academia is one of, we have an extreme inside outsider problem. You've you got, you know. Are you an insider or an outsider? I, I'm, I'm uh, fortunately an insider. Right. But... <laughs> Let's get some questions in and then we'll get, um, we'll get some more answers. Gentleman at the back, Francis at the front, and lady at the far left. Um, I found. Uh, give, give us your name. Keith at Appleyard. Um, I found James's remarks at the start particularly uh, resonant. So I'm, what I'm about to say isn't really a question, it's an observation, but I'd like to see what the panel actually thought about it. The other week I was in my local Sainsbury's supermarket and the person on the till serving me had a streaming cold. She was ill. So I said to her, why aren't you off work? And she said, we're allowed three absences a year of any length, and after that we're on a six month disciplinary. So she says, I can't afford to waste one day for a cold in case I get some of the realness. So I thought that this was an oddball manager beating them up. So I immediately emailed uh, Sainsbury's to see if it was true, and it was like, well, we rely on the managers to keep the workforce motivated, which is a fantastic phrase. And uh, I'm just going to read from my, my email, uh, which a lot. Basically, I went back and said, um, this isn't right. And they said, well, we're just following a law that everybody else follows. Okay. So, as I'm an employer, and a living wage employer at that, I thought, oh, ooh, have I missed a law? Because it's very easy to, get, to, to be out of date. So I said, what's this law you're using that they said all companies use? And the answer was, we can't tell you it's a secret. <laughs> now, it's if anybody at the Resolution Foundation or TUC wants that email chain, you can have it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Peter. The, uh, and then there's a question at the front, Rob. Okay, go ahead. So exactly to what they the microphone's coming. Go ahead. Go on, microphone. Um, I currently have to whisper this. I currently work for Amazon. Um, that was never my choice. Um, I actually had returned from New Zealand uh, for four years taking care of my mother with dementia, which is clearly unpaid. That unfortunately led to civil proceedings because she, of course, got done in by her financial advisor. New Zealand police didn't think it was civil was criminal, they weren't interested, so I bankrupted in the High Court. Um, so uh, it affected my finances a lot. I cancelled a lot of contracts, 
to go back to New Zealand. And I left New Zealand sort of under protest vote very recently, which is I have a British passport. I don't have to stay here under your legal medical laws. Um, because essentially I now have criminal proceedings coming up, but the, the fact is I need to earn a living again. I had extreme stress, yet I had to pay for everything myself. I sold my mother's family home to pay for lawyers, because um, we were seen as particularly, as you were saying, James, middle class. I have two degrees. I have 20 years work experience in London, because as a New Zealander, I'm too overqualified, and it's a farming agriculture country. So I said to professionals in New Zealand, I need the legal paperwork from that psychiatrist because I'm leaving the country and I'm not coming back. And there's going to be a lot of havoc if you don't sign my legal paperwork. So I would take my British passport to my GP and say, you, you medicate me, and that's my only way to get out of the country, to say, I need to earn a living. I have no economic rights in New Zealand, because, of course, I checked out the law, because I used to spend my whole evenings Googling medical laws and legal laws in New Zealand, because every professional gave me a different answer. So sorry to make this so very long-winded, but now that I'm back in London, I obviously wanted a job, and that is my top priority in life right now. I need to get back to earning a living. So I did not choose to work for Amazon. Unfortunately, I worked for a company that got taken over by Amazon, which is Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching the contractual changes that are going on, and I'm very lucky to say that at least I don't have a zero-hours contract. I don't have the thing where I get absolutely no sick pay but I work in a sector where people are sick constantly all the time. I'm actually a health professional, so usually I don't get sick. But the fact is I can see the impact. And I can see already that people are not getting sick pay. And I can see the fact that it has got to the point where usually in the UK when you have Christmas holiday, if you're a full-timer, you at least then only have to work a four-day week. Whereas we were suddenly made to work a five-day week because to the Americans, Christmas Day doesn't really count. But then they've also changed us contractually whereby suddenly you've got to do stock takes till 2 a.m. in the morning and be back at work for seven. No night shift, extra money. Because, of course, Amazon is spending as much of their time and energy on counting their profits. Okay. Thanks for the, Thank you for sharing that. that sounds uh, and I just want to know why the British law is not doing something, especially then I go and read in the newspaper that Amazon owed two million, two billion in tax evasion to the British government, but I hear that the EU were able to cave back some money. They got some, yeah. Okay. So That's great. Thank you. Legally, for sharing a lot that. of questions. I'm That's sorry a lot of questions so here, but no, thank you for sharing that. And then Francis at the front, and then we'll go back to the panel. Mine's a little bit of a story too, but I'll try and be brief. <laughs> <laughs> we love the story, Francis. I think this whole concept of um, individual freedom, entrepreneurialism, running your own business, and so forth is quite insidious because there are sections of the economy that have always worked on the assumption that everybody wants to run their own business, and it's actually very difficult to operate in any other way. I noticed that none of the panelists talked about the growth of self employment which to my mind is a bigger issue than, than zero hours contracts, and has been for quite some time, um, where the growth of, of self-employment actually started before the financial crisis. The sections that I have in mind, I have been part of myself as a perennial member of the gig economy for something like 30 years, off and on. Um, you know, we talk of it, about it as if it's a new phenomenon, but it really isn't. Um, so I've been an IT contractor, and I've been a singing teacher, a peripatetic musician, which is kind of uh, perhaps the original gig economy. <laughs> yeah, so we live from gig to gig, and we have contracts with schools, which are zero hours contracts, um, which um, officially we don't have because if the Inland Revenue find out about them, they'll clamp down and the school will have to put us on the payroll. So they pretend that we are freelance freelancers just so working on the premises. So you're on the everyone's at it end of the market. Yeah, and you know, the degree of control really resonated, you know, how much control because that is that is the edge. Is how much control do they exercise? And I've actually taken schools to court and won over the degree of con control that they exercise. And this is the public sector. Now the reason I'm raising this is uh, we have Kate sitting there on the on the um, 
panel there. And what has really struck me as a long-term denizen of the self-employed gig economy is that um, self-employed gig economy workers like me are not protected at all by trades unions, and never have been. Even though we have trades unions, they don't protect as much. So we have things like the ISM. Um, and, but we work with a very unionized workforce, which is frankly very unfriendly and unwelcoming to gig economy workers like me. They treat us like the sweepings off the floor. The final straw for me was when I was asked to take part in a strike by teachers who were striking for better pensions, as it happened. Um, it was in the time when you know, there was a threat to public sector pensions, yeah? And I said, why, as a peripatetic musician who has to organise their own pension, has no sick pay, no holiday pay, and no pension rights, would I support you? And they said, oh, well, if you, support, if you come and strike with us, then we'll support you when you try and claim for, for, for such things. But they never have. It seems to me that we have two classes of workers. We have those who have legal protection, those who have the protection of the law, and also have the support of unions. Okay, I'm conscious we're not getting around the questions, Francis. Who don't? I want to get some other questions. Okay, that's good. Right, now, James, on uh, Peter's questions about... Um, I don't know what the law is either that you're that Sainsbury's are waving around. The, um, but hopefully your email might tell us. Anyway, James, do you want to reflect on that? Yeah. So I mean, the first day I, I arrived at Amazon, we were told that um, uh, you know if you're if you're sick, if you're ill, you'll have to self-medicate because we need you here. And then when you went to the canteen, there was a big kind of basket of things like lockets and tunes and like cough cough medicine, um, which were, they were selling up. You know, they'd marked it up as well to make a profit on that as well. Um, but they charged you for them. I thought you yeah, made, you had to buy oh, them. I thought you were making. I thought they were offering it free. No, no, you had to self-medicate because um, we need okay. you here. And it, it was one of those. It was a real question of enforcement in some ways. So there were there had been exposés of Amazon before I, I worked there. I mean, I was reluctant to go there um, in some respects because it felt like you know, well, this has been done already. But it was the first job I got. Um, so th you know, there'd been kind of exposés, newspapers in 2013. There'd been a dispatches program in 2013. And then following that, Amazon had come out and said, you know, we no longer operate this sickness policy. Um, we no longer, you know, operate that disciplinaries for toilet breaks and things. And then I went back three years later and exactly the same thing's happening. So, you know, now my books come out. Now they've come, you know, every time I'm on television or in a news or there's something in a newspaper, they, they bombard the, the, the BBC or say The Guardian or something with PR and say that, you know, we no longer... Um, employ people on zero hours contracts. Well, no, they never did when I was there because they, they use agencies to employ everyone. They employ everyone on the zero hours contracts. Um, you know, we no longer operate this sickness policy. Yet I, I have contacts in there who, who told me last month that this is, still, this is still going on. But, you know, where's the sense of people in government actually, you know, why, why it's, it's in the public domain. Repeatedly, it's been put in the public domain. Yet there's, there's no kind of, appetite really on the part of government to actually like go in and, and have a look what's actually going on and speak to workers. It feels like it's, it's not really of interest to, to government. That's what I would say. In, in any of the jobs you did, did any customer or anyone ever engage with you in saying, that's looking pretty crap, what's going on? With Amazon, no. I mean, of course, because no, no, it's no, so Amazon's hard because you're literally, but, um, <laughs> Amazon you kind of locked in. But, the, um, but in like, the example given here, when you were doing your care work or course, I suppose call centres is harder, but... Yeah, I mean, with just Uber, just... Uber people would. Uber? Because you, you have, you know, you're, you're driving the car. And, and sometimes, it was in the news quite a lot, Uber, when I was doing the job. Um, so sometimes people would get in the car and be very interested in, um, in, interested in the situation for drivers. And, um, you know, I suppose the... You told me you were writing a book when they got in the car. One of, one of the... <laughs> no, no. Because then I'd get a kind of uh, false conversation in, in, some, in some respects. But, I mean, there was a really interesting thing about... Like Uber dictated what I could talk about with people who were in my car. That was, um, you know, fight, what a what a strange form of self-employment. Um, we were not allowed to talk about uh, sport. I was going to say football, but that because that's the only sport I would talk about. Foot, not, sport. You're not allowed to talk about sport. No, not allowed to talk about sport, politics, or religion uh, with your passenger. So, yeah, which means you, is a good idea. As a cab driver, there's nothing else you can <laughs> really talk about. <laughs> but but they. What you told? You, were you actively encouraged to talk about anything? No, I mean, you know, like definitely talk about the, this. the obvious like truisms, um, policy. Yeah, no, no, the obvious, the obvious <laughs> truism, law. 
<laughs> you know, be polite, you. be polite and, and courteous, you know, the obvious okay. things. But there was also, you know, there was such a level of control exercised by the company, even more than in many other jobs, where they would control, they would dictate what you could and could not talk about with the person in the back of your car. Um, you know, you can't pick and choose what jobs you what jobs you do. They, they told us during my induction. Um, so you know, the person in the car isn't your customer; it's Uber's customer. But they've um, layered over that with that with this kind of language around autonomy okay. and whatever, um, and it's just a big, big, big lie, basically. Okay. There's obviously a lot of issues raised by the second and third questions, but okay, do you want to touch on either, either what happens when workers are, their firm is taken over by other firms, or what are the trade unions going to do for the self-employed, not just for Francis, but for all of them? Sure. Um, well, I'm really sorry to, sorry to hear about your what sounds like a pretty horrible experience. I mean, I just wanted to reflect on the point about sick pay because we put out a kind of very unscientific survey last year on our website saying tell us about your crappy experience of work basically and not being paid sick pay came up time and time again and I think that's really interesting um, just um, to respond to Francis I mean I'm not going to say there are no situations where unions haven't seen self-employment as a threat and I think sometimes they've been right to see that because you know contracting out jobs to self-employed workers has been a way of downgrading terms and conditions however there is absolutely fantastic work going on in the musicians Union, for example, around organising self-employed workers. Um, really interesting jobs with um, uh, setting up cooperatives. They've got um, fair gig deals with a number of venues, basically, where they've negotiated the rates with um, uh, uh, kind of venues which will pay people on certain rates. One of my favourite examples is um, orchestras and um, intermittent contracts for tuba players who are apparently are not needed all the time <laughs> and making sure that they so have got protection one? during their, con There's that they have continuous employment. Tuba, tuba that is an example of the type of contract you might need. <laughs> or you can talk to people in the NUJ or equity, you know, equity would be a great example equity actually. Equity has done of, a remarkable um, job of getting tax You know, tax, getting tax fair, fair deals for actors. So yeah. I think there is some like long-standing good practice in the trade union movement um, in organising self-employed workers and I'm not going to pretend we don't need to spread that further or in every situation you know that will have been managed perfectly but I think trade unions absolutely have a role in representing let's get some more questions before the uh, sun finally goes down over here on the left uh, it's sorry, it's a small it's, it is on now <laughs> so um, yeah thank you. what was your name sorry uh, my name is Nama um, and uh, yeah, thank you, James, for uh, the book that you wrote about hired. Uh, Is it over there? I, I hadn't realised. Oh, that's the script. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though even though you've covered like the gig economy in terms of uh, the actual actually going out to work in the gig economy, you haven't. I'm not sure if you've talked about micro jobs, which have over half a million people uh, registered online, mm -hmm. um, and whether uh, you've you've mentioned um, the relationship between. Uh, new waves of immigration and the gig economy as well, and race and the gig economy, which which I think plays a big big deal okay. in that. In that, and, and by micro jobs, do you mean do you mean particularly short hour jobs? Or? No, uh, uh, all all um, I'm, I'm talking about all um, zero working hours, specifically okay. in London, um, and precarious work specifically in London, where okay. it's like forty percent ethnic minority. Yep. And the second question is for micro Jeremiah, jobs, yeah. if if uh, uh, so you were talking about uh, the use of algorithms in uh, employment selections and, and in uh, providing work. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering how that comes into play with regards to the new GDPR, the new General Data Protection Law that comes into play on the 25th of May. And that Great. includes the right for human intervention and whether that's still valid with regards to the GDPR, which is law. Great question. Thank and the gentleman actually next to you yeah. as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris Carlton. Um, I'm re really interested in, in, in your perspective on uh, that legislation and, and regulation is, is the answer. Um, I worked for a pre previous employer who remained nameless, who was flouting some of this legislation, although not quite as bad as some of the other examples. But around the time th uh, that I stopped working there, they decided to outsource 350 jobs to India, um, and. Um, I, I just wanted to hear the panel's perspective on ha what the um, effects of, of cracking down might be and whether the economy, particularly local economies, can afford for companies to uh, really walk away from them. Okay. So basically, if we crack down, will people just leave, basically? Yeah. Okay. Should we just get, to get a few people in at once, otherwise we'll run out of time? 
Thanks, my name's Philip Ross. I was, uh, I was one of the founders of Ipsy uh, 18 years ago with yeah. the Contractors Union. Um, uh, and actually, one of the things I was going to ask was about, I was going to be about the roles that you've done, which are about self-employment, because I'm a working freelancer myself. But actually, it's the role of agencies in this, actually, because you, you talk about working through agencies. And one of the things we don't know is the markup agencies are taking off the workers that are actually going through. Because okay. um, there's been an idea going around about open book accounting for agencies, that they should be uh, should declare to everybody what they're, what the margin is they're taking, okay, you know, so that we can change our, be interested to know what people thought. Great, great question. Do you want to go? I think one here. This is kind of partly for Kate, because you said that um, the TUC was against the hours contracts. Um, I spent two years um, after graduating working for Picture House Cinemas, um, in Norwich, but I wasn't part of Bechtia or anything, mm. um, and it, it was good. Um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the nuance. About so the good bit was having had a contract for forty hours before in our previous jobs. If I wanted to take a week off, arranging with other staff was complicated, and they might be like, "Yeah, we're not interested." But actually, at the end of the day, the power was sometimes in my hand. And I could be like, I'm gone, <laughs> and that's it. And and other weeks I'd be like, yeah, I pick up five more shifts and do, you know, 56 hours because yeah. I can, and it's really simple. Now the the precursor that you'll come back, and I just want to hear about the gap in between. It's obviously no sick pay. Obviously, if it went wrong, there was no work. How, how old were you then as well? I'm 26. How, you, how old were you? Oh, 24. 20, between 24 and 26. Yeah. Um, that's a loss of training a little bit. But I mean, just that, that kind of, there was that great flexibility and it was, uh, oh yeah, there was also that goodwill that it was predicated on. And I know that's important. And, and finally, a little one was unionization, age 26, well, 24, 26. <laughs> it feels unfashionable and it feels complicated. Uh, and it actually felt within Picture House that we had our internal union, which was something. But um, but the only unionised aspect was back to in Brixton, and they got a lot of bad press from the internal union, um, and it felt difficult. Surely not. <laughs> well, no, the internal union was made up of just staff members. It was a staff it forum, was wasn't it? Yeah. Called okay. union. But you know, they got a bad press because they they were aggressive. They're yeah, aggressive. fine. You said. <laughs> and I just thought, I just thought it was difficult because yeah. I felt at the time I wanted to, you know, unions. Yeah, having studied political theory, I was like, unions are great. Um, but you didn't want to stand up and be like, anyone want to unionise? Because then my 50 hours might be five. But now you've met Kate and you know that they are actually fashionable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's fine. Okay, great. And, there, who else? and there's one right at the back. And then we are actually, okay, go there. And then this gentleman at the back. Go ahead. Yeah, so it was just in response to the question about agencies. So I work for the Living Wage Foundation and particularly on our service provider um, companies. And... Uh, we strongly argue for the onus of responsible employment to be on the client, so the people who are getting the benefits from the service, rather than the agency themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that this frequently the onus is put on the, the agency when actually it should be on the client because they can put whatever they want in the terms of agreement with that agency to make sure a good service and an ethical service is provided. Okay, great. What was your name? Um, Lucy. Lucy. So, so you want you want Kate's joint and several liability that she's yeah. banging on about. Yeah. But, um, great. And then the gentleman over here, and then we'll go back to the panel, and then people can be released to the dying sunshine. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 uh, it's, just it's, a quick one. Oh, I'm ahead, Emma, can. also from the Living Wage Foundation. I was really interested, um, James, when you were talking about care work uh, in the kind of side comment around the emotional labour. Um, and I think with technology changing, one of the things that's becoming clear is that we are automating processes. So in a way, kind of the future of work for a lot of people will be emotional. Um, and I'm interested from a kind of good employment stance in um, any of the panel's ideas on how employers can uh, encourage development of emotional skills and also from a kind of uh, employee relationship, how we can incentivize emotional work. Great question. Yeah, well, I just wanted to, John Bunners and I, uh, first to say, you know, I thought Turner Hyde was an absolutely tremendous book, a great eye opener. Yeah, yeah. You've Agatha paid him. Therefore, <laughs> 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 <Yeah, four. laughs> it has to be really read. But the, um, I thought the most chilling aspect of the whole thing was first the issue of language, terminology, which misleads the 
public and the workforce to think something healthy is going on when in reality it's a complete deception and that comes through. The other, as it's been pointed out by others, is the use of agencies. And one really thinks, you know, where there's no responsibility held by the people who, who are gaining the benefit from this activity in California and wherever, uh, in, in, in um, and no holding to account for the most fundamental human rights you'd think ought to apply in employment. But the other thing, and well, how do we deal with it? That's the question really for trade unions. And there the question, I think, of issues like boycotts, you know, what we would have done about South Africa is, <laughs> as we did, is what is needed almost now for what's developing. And that's where I think there is a discontinuity between now and the past. Okay, and great. The other aspect, can I just feed in, is, okay, is really the question of artificial intelligence, which of course is going to make employees even more expendable at an ever higher rate. Oh, God, thanks that for that. didn't come into work, <laughs> I think, at all. Okay. And yet it's fundamental, but just a final point. Okay. <laughs> you promised that last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, I mean, I've, I've been storing it up. <laughs> We've all been doing that. It's, <laughs> it's hard life. There, right. You know, there, is there a new structure here? Die Standing says that there's a new class structure being created by the people who work in this form of employment, and it isn't about the working class. It extends right through to the junior members of universities and the whole work. And Germany is the case study there to see how that is happening. The insider-outsider labour market, yeah. which is another huge... That's a great last thought. The, um, right, you've got a lot on here, panel. Okay, so we need to cover... Right, yes, you definitely can. So we've got, we're going to cover agency workers, migrant work, particularly in London. We're going to need to cover... cover everyone's going to give their best example of double speak in bonkers employment law. Uh, you need to give a good example of a zero-hours contract so that we get it and we're down with the kids. The, um, and you've all got to provide your answer on the new class structure. Okay? Right. Let's go. Migrant labour. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that was a really good question. It was something I... I if I had longer to speak, I would have would have talked about that aspect of, of the book. It's in the book, um, specifically about how. Um, so Amazon to start with, um, the the, my, the workforce, the people I were working with, it was it was predominantly Romanian uh, migrants, most of my co-workers, and it creates a diff it created a different dynamic in in the workplace, um, in the sense that uh, many of those people didn't understand the laws um, of this country, um, so it was they were it was easier to exploit them um, essentially. Um, and they also, you know, they had lower, they had lower standards in terms of what they, what they would expect. So, um, a guy I live with was earning, would earn on average, I think, 140 pounds a week in uh, Romania, whereas Amazon, you'd earn if you were paid properly, 270 pounds a week. So there's a, you know, it's a, there's a greater sense of desperation. They would, they told us, one of the agency workers told us on the very first, someone was was kicking off during the recruitment session because they didn't have the right form. And the Transline rep said that, you know, if you don't want the job, there are 70 Eastern Europeans I have waiting for a position. So it was used in the same way that um, unemployed people in the past were used to say, um, that, you know, if you don't want this, you know, if you, if you kick off, we've got these, um, this reserve army of labour. In London, uh, when I was working for Uber, I quickly noticed that, you know, as a, as a, you know, a white English cab driver, Many of the uh, Uber driver, um, specifically, many of the um, uh, passengers that got in my cab would remark on, you know, oh, oh you're English, um, because their, their experience of an Uber driver was they were predominantly uh, migrants doing it. And I think what some people miss um, from the position of the pa being the passenger in the back of the cab is that, you know, they'll talk to their Uber driver and, you know, they'll say, oh, do you like it? And, and the Uber driver will say, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's all right. Or, you know, it's, it's better than what I was doing before. And an Eritrean cab driver I interviewed for Uber, who drove for Uber, he said to me, you know, I say, well, why do these, these cab drivers all say they like it? These, you know, migrant cab drivers, they say, you know, oh, you know, they, they say it's, it's, it's better than what I was doing before. And he's like, James, you don't understand the choices people have. You don't understand the options uh, people like me have. Um, and many of those people who were driving for Uber were migrants who'd come from uh, minicab firms where you aren't being paid the minimum wage. They're kind of half off the radar. Or many of them had come out of restaurants as well. So they were in the back kind of rooms of restaurants. And again, not always being paid uh, the minimum wage, uh, not always having their employment rights respected. And at least with Uber, you know, the algorithm, what it did was it got rid of the, you know, the, the controller from, from like a private firm, which, you know, some of the 
drivers I spoke to said, you know, they would decide, you know, if they didn't like your face, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be eating properly that week. Um, so the algorithm at least did that. But you always have to remember that someone makes a choice in terms of, uh, you know, their job. You know, the, the free market kind of, um, you know, the, the ideological thing is, well, you know, if you don't like it, you can just leave. Well, everyone, all of these, these choices happen within a context. And I think that's especially important when you have something like Uber where it's dominated by uh, migrant labor. Some of the choices uh, people face are often more, they're, they're in a more desperate situation than, than many kind of indigenous, Great. indigenous population. Okay. Agency workers and zero hours contracts being good in some cases. Uh, okay. Well, let me say three things about agency workers that I think would make a difference. Um, one is joint and several liability, as we've talked about, and as our colleague from the Living Wage Foundation picked up on. Um, one is enforcement. Um, EZ, which is the Employment Agency Standards Inspectorate, has, I think, 11 inspectors. Um, there are many more agency workers than that in the UK. Um, that would make a big difference. And then, again, to be a bit tacky, there is this thing called the Swedish derogation, which means that you are allowed to be play paid less than a regular worker if your agency says they will guarantee you work between assignments. It's like the evil version of your tuba contract. <laughs> yeah, and what we think this is being used to do is to employ people and agencies on a long time basis, like in the situation James saw on in Amazon, and use them to undercut the regular workforce. So we think that's a big issue and that's something we could change quite easily. Um, on zero hours contracts, I sort of want to make a kind of bigger point, which is we often kind of say, oh, well, what about all this flexibility? And you hear that a bit in your example about the um, Eritrean. Why can't we have flexibility in our normal workforce and accompanied by rights? It shouldn't be impossible. I'm able to work flexi time if I want to. Uh, many of my colleagues work part time. They are able to flex their hours. They work overtime and they can be paid additionally. Why can we not say that we have flexibility that is accompanied by rights? And I think one of the kind of concerning things around the debate around zero hours contracts, around the debate around some of the gig economy, has said rather than tackle the structural issues in the labour market, we're going to say, oh, well, okay, you can trade that off with, against pay, you can trade that off against security, you can trade that off against the idea that if something goes wrong, like for you might fall sick, that you'll actually have any protection. And I think we have to be a little bit more ambitious than that. I mean, just to talk about the kind of um, Beck 2 and the kind of staff union in Picture House, it's a kind of fascinating example of, you know, Picture House have worked quite hard to make Beck 2 look, oh, it's a bit lame, you know, they're a bit aggressive. They're just fighting for a living wage. It's, you know, maybe not very glamorous, but pretty basic rights. And, you know, it is fashionable, really. Well, I'm not sure if I can make it sound cool, can, but I think it is can. quite important. Okay, right. The, um, these guys have failed, so most extreme double speak. Not from you, in the, in the tech economy. <laughs> well, I've got a whole chaps in the book. Okay, well, give us the best. No, We're not going to read the whole thing. Give us the best. Well, one. And unfortunately, Kate's already cited my best one. I think the language of disruption yep. is, is probably the best example where I think there are some elements of key economy business models that are truly disruptive, but very often disruption is just a cloak for, for breaking the law. Yep. And, and again, you sound a bit sort of old fashioned, like the Oxford Law Don, when you say, well, actually, you just comply with the law. But, but that's it, right? So, I mean, the same, the same story sort of continues that. Um, in various sort of tech startup co um, competitions, when people are looking for funding, um, this this journalist used to sit on the panels awarding the sort of seed funding for for VC money. Noticed that more and more frequently, um, the jurors would ask the people pitching their new business model, sort of saying, you know, but but is this legal? And the cool answer to that became, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, and that is an idea of... I mean, what kind of uh, investor was like, yeah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, quite a few billion dollars worth of money uh, are behind that, right? Okay. So I think that when it comes to double speak, I think okay, there's a really question of what's disruption okay. and where's it breaking the law? Um, your question about the GDPR, and now we really, you know, Thursday at half seven. <laughs> We're not finishing on GDPR. Talk <laughs> so about GDPR. Um, I think there's a really interesting question about ratings in particular, right, and who owns the ratings. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is this idea that maybe actually there should be portability of these ratings. That you say the sort of data created by a worker in the course of, you know, her time on a platform, that may well actually be her property. And that, you know, she may well have to have the right to have some sort of portability with those kind of rights. Final thing and goes back, in a sense, yep. to this double speak question, is this sort of myth and this sort of misunderstanding of what employment law is and how it works. And I, sort of, I can say this as well from the perspective both of being an employee but also actually being an employer, because as a college in Oxford, Maudlin, we employ a couple hundred um, people. So I, I sort of you know, deal with HR from, from both perspectives as yep. well. And yeah, I mean, again, Kate's already mentioned this, this idea that there's a sort of 
absolute incompatibility between flexibility and employment rights, legally, that's just wrong. There's absolutely nothing to say at all. And, you know, not everybody's as lucky as, as you know, people who have complete freedom. But from a legal perspective, there's absolutely nothing at all to say that you can't have flexible work and you can have the full set of employment rights. In English law at the moment, with the opposite extent, we have a sort of, you know, paradox of precarity, really, where, in fact, the, the more stable, the more permanent, the sort of nicer your job is, the more are you likely to actually be protected by the law. Yeah. And the more precarious, the more sort of intermittent, the more sort of, you know, prone potentially to exploitation you are, the less likely the law is, is to protect you. Well, that's a really happy thing to finish on. <laughs> uh, so thanks for that, Vim. But we've also, we're, we are 40 seconds away from being 15 minutes late and lying. So that, that, so that is uh, where we'll wrap up. Can we just um, thank our panel for not only writing their books, but for coming along? Thank you for your uh, questions. And if you didn't need, uh, you didn't get enough reason to buy the book because it was really great hearing them speak. The other thing to think about is it's just so good that we've got like the world of work in the headlines and in books. And if you don't buy the books, then they won't happen again. And then we won't understand what's changing in the labour market next time. And then we won't be able to build a better future. So you better buy the books if you want to make a better Britain. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>